Well is saying thank you. The well is saying thank you. We give you praise today. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Hallelujah. Please sit down. God bless you. Welcome to church. If you are online, we welcome you to the well Oasis International. This is our main service. And we've been in the series on the parables of Jesus for the last four weeks. And it's going to continue for I don't know how many more weeks, but um Today is the fourth installment, the fourth installment. And so far, what's one of the, uh, some of the few things, some of the things we've learned, number one is that the kingdom of God is the rule of God. It's the reign of God and not the realm of God. The kingdom of God is the rule of God and not the realm of God. It's not somewhere that God resides, it's wherever his power is manifest, hallelujah. Now, if you remember, I did say that we're looking at, in this trench of the parables of Jesus, there are 40 parables in all, and 13 of those parables begin with, and the kingdom of God is like. And so we're focused on the 13 parables that begin with the kingdom of God is like. I think this will be our seven, by the time we finish today, we'll have looked at seven out of the 13. The kingdom of God is like. Now, a few things I want to remind you as we do a quick recap is that parables are lessons using simple same things to explain complicated unseen ones. A parable is when you take a simple concept to explain a more complicated and possibly unseen concept. Hallelujah. Now, we said that in this thrust, what we want to focus on is kingdom because the um, the, 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 the thrust of Jesus' message all the while he was on, in the physical and the earth was kingdom. We are the ones that speak denominations. We are the ones that speak church. We are the ones that speak nations. Jesus only spoke kingdom. And so we are looking at and exploring what it looks like. What does kingdom look like? Why was Jesus so focused on the, on the subject matter of kingdom? We want to try and understand kingdom. Because like I told us, in Genesis chapter 1, we were given the mandate to represent kingdom here on earth. And in Matthew chapter 6, in what we call the Lord's Prayer, we were reminded that we are supposed to allow, we are the enforcers of kingdom in the earth. Hallelujah. Something else that I did say is that the earth is not the word. That the word is the system. The earth is the landmass. That the things that rule the earth is, 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 are the systems, and those systems are called the word, are, are what is referred to as the word. And when we are looking at kingdom, it is so that we will see the template of kingdom, so that we can bring kingdom to bear on the earth. Hallelujah. Something else that we said here is that the kingdom has two dimensions. The heavenly kingdom and the kingdom of God in the earth as represented by the church. So therefore, I said, and I use this exact expression, I said the kingdom, the church is not the kingdom of God. The church is the representative of the kingdom of God. The church is not the kingdom of God. The church is the representative of the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. So there are two dimensions of kingdom, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of, of the earth, of, or the kingdom of God in the earth as represented by the church. Now the kingdom of heaven is perfect. Like the kingdom of God in the earth is not perfect. Because everyone, it's open for everyone to come in. But we said that before the, the unification of kingdom would happen, before the kingdom of, in heaven or, or the kingdom of the earth would merge with the kingdom of God in heaven, that there will be what? There will be a purification. And that purification will lead to a glorification. And that is how the kingdom of God, as represented by the church on earth, merges with the kingdom of God in heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Other things that we talked is that the parables of the kingdom describe the development and the evolving concept of kingdom. Hallelujah. 
I did say that when the kingdom started, when the concept of kingdom started, that it was, it, it, it looks like God had this big picture, but he's unveiling it in bits and pieces. And the culmination came when Jesus came, when John the Baptist came and said, the kingdom of God is at hand. And Jesus came and said, the kingdom of God is here. Hallelujah. But when Jesus was living in the flesh, he promised a soon coming kingdom. Do you remember that? And it is in the fullness of that kingdom that you and me would be merged by his grace and mercy and we become the true kingdom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I did say that the kingdom affects the world because spiritual things govern physical things or earthly things. So, therefore, if kingdom is positioned properly, what should happen is that the kingdom would do what? It would affect the world. That's number one. Now, I also said that, or we also looked at the fact that the kingdom, based on some of the parables we had looked at, we said that the kingdom is open to everybody, sincere people and insincere people. We use the analogy or the parable of the dragnet to analyze that. And they all come as when the people for whom the wedding feast was prepared, they refused to come. And the master said, go out out. The king said, go out and just bring anybody. But for them to come in, you have to give them the wedding garment. And what we saw was that there was this guest who received this wedding garment. But he came to the wedding and decided to come in his own clothes. Which brings us to the next thing that I want to remind you. The kingdom of God can only be accessed by the terms of God. Or on the terms of God. The kingdom of God cannot be accessed by your terms. And so we said that it is okay to come in as you are. But if you choose to remain as you are, then a day of reckoning and a day of accountability and judgment is going to come and you'll be asked to leave. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So therefore, the kingdom of God or the kingdom holds those in it accountable. It can only be accessed on God's terms and before the merge, the kingdom in the earth will be purified. Because the Bible says that God will present to himself, what? A church without blemish and without wrinkle. And that is the process of glorification. That is the thing that makes us ready to be able to merge with the kingdom of God in heaven. Hallelujah. Today we'll look at three parables. And these parables, you know, some people will say that these parables are lumped together when you teach the parables of the kingdom because they have to do with money. I would adjust that a bit and say that the reason why these parables are lumped together is because they have to do with the transactions. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They have to do with transactions. Hallelujah. So if you remember, with the very first installment, I said that out of the 13 parables, there were three that spoke about money-related issues. Hallelujah. These are those three that spoke about a transaction. And so another facet or another aspect of the kingdom of God is going to be um, unveiled for us today so that you see what it looks like to be in the kingdom. Hallelujah. Amen. So if you open with me quickly to Matthew chapter 13... Matthew chapter 13, we want to look at the parable of the hidden treasure and the hidden pearl. Or the precious pearl. Hallelujah. The parable of the hidden treasure and the parable of the costly pearl. That's how my Bible in the Amplified says it. The parable of the hidden treasure and the parable of the costly pearl. The third parable will be the parable of the unforgiving servant. But that of the hidden treasure and the costly pearl... Uh, in Matthew chapter 13, beginning from verse 44, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like a very precious treasure hidden in a field where a man found and hid again. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all he has and buys that field, securing the treasure for himself. Again, verse 40, 45, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of pearls. And upon finding a single pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Hallelujah. The, the, the parables, one is talking about a treasure in a field, and the other one is talking about a pearl. The major difference, the um, big similarity is that these two men found something valuable. One stumbled upon it, the other did what? The one in, other one intentionally went out looking. Hallelujah. But they both found something that was, um, what's the word, valuable. And they both sold everything else that they had so that they could get that to that thing that was valuable. Hallelujah. Remember that the way we've been teaching this is that we will look at the story. Then we will look at the story behind the story. Amen. 
We'll look at the story, and then we'll look at the story behind the story. Now, a hired worker or a servant, or maybe someone, a surveyor, someone, the land wasn't his. The field was not his own. So he's most um, he most possibly was a worker of that field. He went, you know, he, only God knows what he was doing. He was a hired worker. That, and he went and he was doing whatever he was doing. He was probably digging for the master. And in the process of digging from the master, he hit gold. And he could tell that there was a treasure on this land. Of course, the master didn't know that there was a treasure in the land, so it seems. On the land, so it seems. So what did he do? He went and sold everything that he had and came and bid for that land and bought it. Of course, remember, he did not disclose that there was a treasure in the land. He, did, he, he bid for it, he bought it, just so that he can have the treasure, so that he will have access to the treasure. Hallelujah. The second one was a man who dealt in precious stones. So his job or his modus operandi is to go looking for precious things or precious jewels to buy. On this day, he found a really valuable pearl. A really valuable pearl. This was a businessman. And he, by the time he saw the pearl, he knew that he couldn't buy it with the money that he had on him that day. So what did he do? The Bible said he went back, sold everything that he had, and came back and bought this pearl. Hallelujah. The thing is, two people set out. And now, both of them have valuables in their hands. One stumbled upon it. He wasn't looking for it. He was just going through the normal course of his day. And he stumbled upon a value. But you see, there's something that happened. He recognized that it was something valuable. And because he recognized it, there was no sacrifice. There was no um, price too high that was not, that was too high that he wouldn't pay to lay his hands on that treasure. Hallelujah. The other one went looking for business. And he found something beyond what he had ever seen before. He found a costly pearl and he said, this is worth everything that I own. He went and sold it all and came and bought the pearl. Hallelujah. The story. It is important to know that the first man, when he found the pearl in the field, did not steal it. He didn't pretend that he would come back and do the work. And at night, which is what most of us would do, say the owner of the land does not know that there's a treasure here. So at night, come and try to dig it out and run away with it. Instead, he disclosed, he said, I want to buy the field. It's not left for the owner of the field to say, I know there's treasure there. So if you want to buy it, you will pay me X amount. But he offered to buy the field, hallelujah. So that is something you want to pay attention to and hold in one hand. He did not falsify the documents if he was the surveyor. He did nothing of the such, such. He came through the door ultimately, even though he stumbled on it, he came through the door ultimately and he said, I want to buy the land. And they said it was worth, worth this much. He didn't have them all of that money. He sold everything that he had and then came and bought the land. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The second parable is a merchant who deliberately seek him for pearls. So this one know, knew what he was looking for. He was looking for precious things. And then he found this one beyond anything he had ever seen before. And he decided that I will buy this one. I will sell everything else that I have, which would include some merchandise that he has. He sold everything and came and bought this one pearl. Who sells all that he has to buy one piece of pearl? But that was what this man did. Now, I'm still looking at the story just as it is told. Remember that to ascertain the value of treasures, precious stones, the valuator must have been trained to recognize which item is valuable and which item is not. What that means is that the man who sought treasure already had been trained to recognize treasure. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible talks about the spirit of discernment. The Bible, this man knew that this was something that was important. The one who saw the pearl and chose to sell everything that he had to take the pearl also was trained. Somehow they were trained to recognize value when they saw it. The question that I'd like to ask the church of Jesus Christ is how many of us recognize value when we see it? Because the value didn't look like it. I don't think that this pearl was refined yet. Obviously, the treasure in the field had not been refined. How many of us will see treasure in its raw form and identify it or recognize it? But really, that's not our focus today. So that's just something you need to think about as we go along. 
They both sell what they had, and they came and they bought what they recognized as valuable. This would be a good place for me to say to you, in the name of Jesus, ha. In the name of Jesus. Sangozi was praying that time. When she gave the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, yes, something leapt on the inside of me. She said, I will run thus. That is, I have set myself. The Bible says, like this, I've set my face as a flint. And then when she got to, by my God, I just like want, wanted to bust open. Because I started to add the words, by my God, I've scaled a fence. By my God, I've run through a, a troop. By my God, by my God, by my God, by my God. If you do not pay attention to this teaching we've been make, doing about the kingdom of God, the tendency is you will still end up being in touch and people can sell you sawdust for snow. Let me put it like that because today I'm nice. They will sell you sawdust for snow and you will sell everything and get sawdust. We are not here for ourselves. We are not here because this is not about something that, that can be corrupted. This is not about something that can, you know, that can after a while fade away. This is about eternity. And if Jesus of his three years of active ministry, all that he talked about was kingdom, any smart person will say, let me even pay attention to what the one that all of this Christianity is about, is talking about. Kingdom. Hallelujah. Amen. So both parables are the same, except that one stumbled on the treasure by accident, and the other one went looking for a treasure. Now the story behind the story, first and foremost, how many of us really woke up and we knew that we were going to get a born again on that day? I was running for my life. Maybe you were so spiritual that you just knew that you, you know, today is the day that had been written that I would get born again. Hallelujah. So today I go to church and when the pastor gives an altar call, makes an altar call and appears for the verdict, I would just come up and say, oh yeah, today is that day. I didn't know. I just knew that I was, I felt like I was dying. And what I was looking for wasn't kingdom. What I was looking for was a solution not to die. And I ran into church early this morning, and they did all the things that they do. It felt nice, but it wasn't it. Because nobody appealed to me to come that, in that first event, at that first church event. So I came out, and I knew that I had not found what I was looking for. Then I went into this place, and those ones did ask me, will you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Like I said, it wasn't because I really wanted him as, I sa as my Savior. I just wanted him to save me in the way I was feeling in my head like I was dying. But I'm so grateful that if you give him an inch, he would take 10 miles. And so I just wanted relief for the thing that I was feeling. And he hooked me. And it has been a journey for many, many, many years now. I don't know about you, therefore, I'm perhaps like the first man in the first parable. I just went looking for what I will eat today. I went to try and see what it is that I need for my business. I was going to see a client about some money. I was going to see so a sister about a dress. I was going to see someone about a bag. But then I stumbled on something beyond. I walked in there and there was a Bible study going on. That's how I got in here. I don't know about you, but that's how I got in here. But you see, whether you woke up that day and you already knew that it was written in the stars that today was the day you gave your life to Jesus, unlike me, you rolled like sad door and you lumped to yourself and you found yourself inside. The good news is that we are in here. So the question is, what will you do with being in here? That's the question. Hallelujah. Because the kingdom of God mostly is not obvious. If it was obvious, nobody would be on the street. You know that? If everybody recognized the value that the kingdom held, do you honestly think one person will stay outside here? Do you think we will need to beg them to come in? Do you need to, and the kingdom of God, we have agreed is not church, so this is not about church. I'm talking about a relationship. Most of us don't know the value of a relationship with God. We just think that it's the same old, same old. You wake up, you, and all those things that we do in between. But the reality is if you truly recognize value, the next point in the story behind the story is that the kingdom of God is worth everything that you have right now. The kingdom of God is worth everything that you have right now. Because both men recognize that this kingdom, this 
valuable pearl and this valuable treasure, it didn't matter how much money they had in before this time. That thing was worth everything that they had owned all their lives. The Bible doesn't tell us how long they had lived. The Bible doesn't tell us how wealthy they are. The Bible doesn't tell us any of those things. But the Bible did tell us that they had possessions. And that those possessions were worth selling. Enough to buy a treasure. My question is, do you even recognize the value? Because some of us come in and then we become familiar. And we pick and we choose that what we would participate in because, you know, going to church becomes, let me tick the box. Today is Sunday, yeah, it's first Sunday, so today is a Sunday with Tai Gele. Today is a good day for us to really dance. So, yeah, first Sunday makes sense. Third Sunday, not that much. Third Sunday is the day we go for evangelism first before we get into the service. You're hot and you're sticky by the time you come from evangelism. Third Sunday isn't such a good day to go to church. We pick and we choose because we do not recognize that being here is rehearsal for the big kingdom. Do you understand it? So we think, oh, we're just marking time. But no, kingdom is not about marking time. The kingdom is worth everything. Years ago, we had a retreat um, at the Sister Power Retreat, and there's an exercise. Actually, I think we even did it um, last year in, um, in the UK. There's an exercise we call the Eye of the Needle, where people come and they have to go through half a hula hoop, crawl on their belly to go through half a hula hoop after re listening to some recording that we have. And every time, Every single time. I have never seen that thing happen where people don't fall on their faces, convicted by the Spirit of God, and just go crazy, weeping and rolling on the floor because they can see. But, but part of the narrative of that recording that we play talks about something called the circle of the earth and talks about how when you get to the circle of the earth, you may need to pass through the eye, you will need to pass through the eye of the needle. That's, that, uh, that is you on this side, which is the word or the earth that we're in, and you need to pass to the other side that represents kingdom. And when you get to the eye of the needle, it's a thin, narrow place that you need to go. But most of the time when people come, they have their degrees. They have their wives. They have their children. They have their houses. They have their positions. They have their every. Some of them bring their slaves. And the thing is, they want to go through the eye of the needle, carrying everything through. And the narrator would say something like, the Lord said, no, you cannot take this with you. And you remember, Lord, I spent 14 years in university getting that. He says, it doesn't matter where you are going. Oh, Lord, my wife is one of the most precious things to me. He says, oh, this, on this journey, everyone needs to go by themselves. Oh, Lord, do you remember how much it cost me to import these um, um, golden door handles that I brought from Italy to fit in my house? He says, you don't need them where you are going. And so the man who is able to let everything go on this side and goes through the eye of the needle is the one that passes through. The one that holds on to his baggage and his luggage and insists that they have to expand the eye of the needle so that he can get through. That one never does get through. That's where you find the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, um, the, yes, the, the conversation about it is easier for a, a, for a, a camel to pass through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. That's where you get that com uh, conversation from. However, here's the beautiful thing about going through the eye of the needle. As long as you take a look at everything on this side, you have achieved all of them. And you decide at the moment you are told that you have to leave them here and go through the eye of the needle and you drop them here. Everyone who drops them here and goes across is surprised. By the time they get there, they, all these and more are waiting for them on the outer side. Hallelujah. All of that to explain to you that the kingdom of God is worth anything. The kingdom of God is worth anything, everything. Many, a few years ago, not too many years ago, it was at, towards the end of the year like this, and I was busy saying to God, what will we do next year? How are we going to do? What is the journey like? Da, 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 da. And one day he said to me, he said, this year, you will go many places alone. And I was like, I just got used to going with people. Please don't let me go alone. At least let one person go with me. He said, no, this time, you would have to go many ways alone. So we had been debating that back and forth until we got 
I think it was the, the night before, it was the 30th or 31st, and I heard him loud and clear. He said, will you go if no one goes with you? I had to say, okay, I will go. And I had to write it in my Bible that I was using at that time, in cuffs. I will go even if no one goes with me. But that year, I think that year was 2017 or 2016. I'm not remembering. But that was one of the best years of my life. Because in agreeing to go alone, every stretch that I had to go alone, when I stopped to rest, the Lord had someone waiting. Do you understand this conversation? The kingdom of God is worth everything that you have. To be able to go into the kingdom, your mindsets would have to be dropped. Your beliefs will have to be dropped. Your values will have to be dropped. Your goals will have to be dropped. Your sins will have to be dropped, obviously. Your pleasures will have to be Anything that does not align, you have to drop it. Even the ones that we think align, to go in, you have to go. It's you and your maker going in. Hallelujah. So when we talk about kingdom, we're not talking about one of the many kingdoms. And um, when I went to, I went for a course in 2018, and that was where I heard for the first time that in the nation of India, they had 330,000 gods. So as far as they're concerned, you can come and preach the gospel. They have no problem with the gospel, with the God of heaven and Jesus, as long as you present him as one of their gods. Where it becomes tricky is when you begin to say he's the only God. They, don't have, they, do not have, they have no tolerance for that kind of conversation. Because there, if you went out and you bought yogurt, and the yogurt was really yummy and chummy, you can decide that the yogurt had become a god. And so you can buy another bowl and go home and set up an altar for that yogurt. And people will come and worship the yogurt with you. Do you understand this? But the kingdom we're talking about is not like any of those ones. The kingdom we're talking about is the one and only kingdom, ultimately, that will be standing. The Bible says everything will be shaken. But this is the only one that will be standing. Hallelujah. The fourth thing or so, I don't remember, in the story behind the story for these first parables, is that this kingdom will cost you something. This kingdom will cost you something. Most of us, it's not that we don't know the value of the kingdom. Where we have issues is what it will cost us. Halfway through what it will cost us, we begin to think, do I really want to go now? How about we just find a way not to go? So it's not that you don't know the value. It's that what you have to leave behind to get in is so much more than what you are take, you, in your mind you are taking in with you. The kingdom will cost you. It will cost you something. The kingdom, however, is waiting for everyone to discover. That's why it's whosoever, whosoever, whosoever. It doesn't say who, those who are tall enough. It doesn't say those who are educated enough. It doesn't say those who have never sinned before. It's whomsoever would come. You have access to kingdom because kingdom is waiting to be discovered. Now, the thing about the discovery is whether you discover by design or you discover by accident, it doesn't matter. How you come in is not what matters. What you do when you get in is what is important. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So let's quickly go on to the next parable, the parable of the debt of the unforgiving servant. You find that in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18 from verse 21 to 35. Matthew 18, 31, uh, 21 to 35. From 21 to 35. Now, before this time, we heard Jesus talking. And he was talking about discipline and prayer. And he was telling them, look, if, you, if, if, if your brother does something to you, and then you call him in private and just discuss with him how to resolve issues and all of that. So when we get to verse 21, because I don't have time to background it, go read it. Peter asked him and said, Lord, so how many times was my brother sin against me? And I will forgive him and let it go. It's seven times enough. Because in Jewish tradition, you forgive exactly three times. If someone hurts you, you forgive them three times. After the third time, you are not compelled to forgive. Hallelujah. That was the culture. So when Peter was saying to Jesus, what if I forgive up to seven times? Peter had done overdrive. Do you understand it? Peter had gone above and beyond the call of duty. I'm sure he was feeling really cool with himself that the Lord will be pleased with me. I am willing to forgive seven times. And the Lord took one look at him and said, well, you've tried, Peter. 
But forgiveness that is numbered is no forgiveness. So Jesus said, no, that's not what you do. I say to you, not up to seven times, but 70 times seven times. 17 times seven times. 17 times seven. Now, I know someone is trying to do the math. What is 70 times seven? The point is, before you count that uh, Stabi offended me yesterday and the day before and the day before, in four days, Stabi offended me 14 times. The reality is before you get to 10 days, you will forget how many days you've counted. The idea was you would not be able to number. Forgiveness is supposed to be given as it is required. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor. Forgiveness is meant to be given as it is required. But Jesus saw an opening for it, what I call a teaching moment. He knew that just to say to Peter, 70 times, 70 times will not be enough. So he needed to use a story, a parable, a simple parable to explain the complicated concept of forgiveness in the kingdom. So he said to him, verse 23, Therefore the kingdom of, God, of heaven is like a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the accounting, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But because he could not repay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and everything that he possessed and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees and begged him saying, I have, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. And his master's heart was moved with compassion and he released him and forgave him, canceling the debt. But that same servant, slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began choking him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow slave fell on his knees and begged earnestly, Have patience with me, he said. I will repay you. But he was unwilling, and he went and had him thrown in prison until he paid back the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what, he had, what had happened, they were deeply grieved, and they went and reported to their master with clarity and in detail everything that had taken place. Then his master called him and said, You wicked and contemptible slave, I forgave all that great debt of yours because you begged me. Should you not had, have had mercy on your fellow slave who owed you little by comparison as I had mercy on you? And in his wrath, his master turned him over to the torturers and he paid all that he owed. My heavenly father will also do the same to every one of you if each one of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. Hallelujah. I said that these parables were lumped together because they had to do with what? Transactions. Transactions. Now, this is not a regular slave. This is not a house slave. This is a slave who does business. Do you understand it? So what the, what the king did was he gave him 10,000 shekels eh? or 10,000 talents to go and do what? It's for an investment. He was supposed to go invest with it. And he lost the investment. Hallelujah. Now when you hear 10,000, you're thinking, what is 10,000? So I had to find out what is a talent. 10,000 talents. What is a talent? It turns out that a talent, because it's a measure, you get? A talent weighs between 50 and 60 k kg for one talent. And this guy lost how many? Eh? I saw a, um, a commentary that said that if what he lost was 10,000 talents of silver, he would have lost his master $200 million. If what he lost was gold, he would have lost his master one point something billion dollars. That's what he lost. Hallelujah. I want you to see the magnitude of what was forgiven. And then the master said, no wonder the master said, sell him, sell his wife, go and excavate his grandmother and father and sell them as well. Sell everything that is. I'm not sure it would have paid, but at least the master would have gotten something back. And he fell on his knees and he started to beg. What you will notice is that the exact words he used to beg was the exact words his fellow slave used to beg him. Please be patient with me. I will repay you. But the moment he fell and he started to beg the king, the king said, look, I forgive you. 
And when you think that the king forgave him and sent him away, then you are not reading the story right or the parable right. Because the reason why they kept saying his fellow slaves, his fellow slaves, was after the master forgave him, he restored him to his position. That's how much forgiveness he got. He stepped out and they said someone owed him 20, how many denarii? 100 denarii, which couldn't have been more than $2,000, if at all. And he held him and he started to choke him. And he said, look, pay me my money. Throw him in jail. Do this and do that and do that. And had him put, thrown in jail until they went to tell the king. The last thing I want you to see, or the last um, sentence in verse 35, he says, my heavenly father will also do the same to you. To every one of you, if each of you does not do what? Forgive his brother from your heart. Hallelujah. What is the story then? What is this story? Let's look at it. The story is a slave invested a fortune on behalf of the master. We looked at all of that. In the end, the master cancels his debt and restores him. Hallelujah. Amen. Because he couldn't afford to pay. This slave goes out to harass another slave who owed him next to nothing. The master is told and then in the process, he is thrown in jail to be tortured. What is the story behind the story? Offenses will come in the kingdom, especially the kingdom here. The analogy that the church is a hospital is very critical for you to know. In church, people would hurt you. In church, people will break your heart. In church, people will scam you of money. In church, remember that the church is the representative of the kingdom of God on earth. That's what kingdom is like. Until kingdom is glorified, all, of, all kinds of things will happen. Offenses will come. So it's not a problem. In the kingdom, offenses will exist right now in this kingdom. And that's because as we are here in this room today, and if you're online, we are representative of kingdom. But if we'll be truthful to ourselves, we are grappling with different kinds and levels of sin. We are in the process of glorification. That's why we come to church. To get more debris out of us and more the next time and not more the next time. It's a sanctification process that we are going through. Hallelujah. Yeah. So offense will always exist in church or in kingdom as represented here in, or, uh, um, in, in the earth. So therefore, forgiveness ought to be voluntary. Forgiveness ought to not it's not something you coerce out of people. Forgiveness ought to be voluntary. For, forgiveness is something you give, recognizing that offense will come. What that means, therefore, is that you cannot join a church, for instance, and decide that this church that I'm going, nobody will ever step on my toe. I like the way God works. The very day you bought this really brand new pair of shoes, really expensive one, somebody who did not wear shoes to church and had mud will stamp on your white shoes, then let's see whether you will die. Offense will come. Forgiveness ought to be voluntary. The story behind the story is that in kingdom, mercy is the answer. Mercy is the answer. In the world, we pursue justice and we pursue exaction. I must get my pound of flesh. But in kingdom, mercy is the answer for when offense comes. Remembering that you and me made it in because someone had mercy. Hallelujah. Amen. You are seated here in this room and you're online listening. Because what? Because God had mercy. We didn't deserve the mercy. And I need us to always recognize that mercy was paid for. So the big thing about this story is that mercy is our guarantee. It is the down payment that you and I would make it. Therefore, if we cannot show mercy to others, God may withdraw his mercy from us. That is kingdom. That's why Jesus can take a look at someone and say, go away, you work out of iniquity. I do not know you. For those of you that are still peddling, once saved, forever saved. Did you not read your Bible? Mercy is our guarantee. So what's the evolving concept of kingdom today and the lessons that we can learn from today's parables? The kingdom is not easy to find. 
That's number one. But once you find it, it is worth everything that you have. Because even the first parable that the guy stumbled upon the treasure, remember that the Bible said he was digging. Then he hid it again before he went to do a bargain for the field. Hallelujah. The kingdom is not easy to find, but once you find it, it is worth everything that you have. Otherwise, none of us would have made mistakes before we got here. We'll be born from our mother's womb out straight into kingdom. But no, that's not the, the way it works. Even some of us that were raised <coughs> right in the church, the representative of kingdom, we veered off. Then a day came and we came back. Hallelujah. So the kingdom is not easy to find, but once you find it, it is what? Worth everything that you have. Number two, those in the kingdom are guaranteed to be in spiritual treasure and more. If you are in the kingdom, then you can be sure that the Lord has something that money can buy. And the Bible calls that thing the Holy Spirit. Remember that, that song, it's something more than gold. The spirit of the Lord in the life of man is something more than gold. We have, that, the Bible says it's the endless deposit. If you want to buy a house and you put down a down payment or a deposit, the, it is where people are honorable, it means that they can't sell that house because you have your money tied down in it. Hallelujah. The Bible does not just call it a down payment. He calls it an earnest deposit. That is, this one was thought through. It was excruciating for the person that put it down. It cost the life of the son of God. Yet, he put it down. Just so that you can get what? Because the first thing you get is that a measure a spirit of the spirit is given to you. And once you have that, that is the treasure. Hallelujah. That is the treasure. A believer who understands the power of the spirit of God in him will not toy with that. My husband, in describing the Holy Spirit, he says that the Holy Spirit is the power of God that beats up the devil time and time and time again. He will tell you, he said, the Holy Spirit is the one that makes expensive things cheap. He makes expensive things cheap. He makes scarce things abundant. He takes you from the back of the queue to the head of the queue. In case you're still wondering, what is the treasure in the kingdom you get of the Spirit of God? And the moment you get of the Spirit of God and you walk with him, what happens is you see as he sees. You hear the things that ordinary ears cannot hear. You do extraordinary things because by the Spirit you are graced to do the things that ordinarily you cannot do. Hallelujah. So those in the kingdom are guaranteed to be in spiritual treasure and much more. To be rich in spiritual treasure and much more. Hallelujah. The evolving concept or lesson number three is that mercy guarantees your faith, your place, and your growth in the kingdom. If you go to Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the merciful for what? They shall what? The gospel brings them in. Love keeps them in. The gospel brings them in. The gospel is the good news of Jesus. He died for your sins and my sins. And, you know, he's the son of God. You know, God gave his only begotten son to die. That whosoever would, um, how does this say it? We're not, be, uh, we're, not be, we're not perish, but have eternal life. Yes. That is the gospel. You see what God did to bring you in. But when you get in here, when we get into kingdom, mercy is what keeps, keeps us. God continues to have mercy on you and me. That, don't tell me that since you became born again, you haven't done something. That if God were me, I would have rolled my eyes and I would have found someone to help me escort you out of the building. But we keep going and coming because mercy, his, his, his you know, it, 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 how does it say it? It says, um, it says he keeps mercy for up to what? A thousand generations. So when you look at these parables today and we look at the expansion of the, of the concept of kingdom, more things you will learn today, number one, is that the kingdom is costly. The kingdom is costly. It is worth everything that you own right now. 
It is what everything that you own right now, you ought to let it go so that you can walk into the kingdom. What is it that you're holding on to that is impeding your relationship with God? If you let it go, you can go through the eye of the needle. And I can assure you that when you get to the other side, above, exceedingly above, beyond all that you can ask, all that you can think, all that you can dream is what God does. But even if he would not do that, the kingdom as is today is worth everything. Hallelujah. So even if you didn't learn anything at all, learn that. The second thing is that you got into kingdom by mercy. Everyone who will come into kingdom will not be perfect. You are not perfect either. So therefore, we must transact by mercy. We shall transact in mercy. So forgive. Jesus said forgive, not seven, not seven times, but 70, that's 70. Because the mercy of forgiveness that is numbered is not forgiveness. So it opens for you and me the fact that you see the kingdom of God, it's a whole journey. But there are templates and there are rules. It's not somewhere you come into when you are running from being hurt. People will hurt you right in here. And then when they do, extend to them the mercy that you received that brought you in. Hallelujah. Amen. One thing else I learned is that some people will come into kingdom with their eyes clear. I'm going to kingdom. <laughs> not me. Some of us got in here by tumbling. It's like you were just running on top of something and the thing caved and you found yourself inside there. It took three years before I recognized what I was doing. I thought I was there playing church like everybody until one day. The thing don't hook me for truth. There's nothing else I can do. I'm stuck. Great way to be stuck if you ask me. But very apprehensive if you don't understand it yet. Hallelujah. That's the way kingdom unfolds. But kingdom is beautiful. It's beautiful. The Bible says, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? This is how you guarantee that no matter what you lose, the most important thing, you will not lose it. That's the concept of kingdom that I bring before us today. My brothers and my sisters, five times is okay. But you see, inside of kingdom, you are dealing with human beings. Some of them were thieves before they got here. And so there's no soap to wash away thieving in one day. So someone will still steal from you. Some of them were lazy and slothful before they, get, they got here. And it really doesn't matter how hard you try. Sometimes they will go back to their old ways. And you ought to be willing to just show mercy. Some of us were fantastic liars before we got here. And just because we're in a building where they say Jesus does not change anything. Once in a while we would have a relapse. And when we get into this thing. So what am I saying? Bring out your forgiveness guns today. Let your stamp be ready. Before I offend you next, stamp it forgiven. 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 Because that's the only way where people we bring in get to stay. Do you understand this? It's not perfect people that come here. That's why I keep reminding you every Sunday that a day is going to come where the glorification will happen. All the things that plague us will be taken out and then we will be ready to go on this journey to be merged with the kingdom of heaven. But until that day comes, I will yell at you. But that's because I'm human and I've been in traffic for four hours in Lagos and my brain is melting. You ought to step back and say, Stabi, it looks like she's crazy today. I'm going to just have mercy. I'll forgive in advance. One of the greatest things that made me th know that Mahmoudi was the person to hold on to for all of my life. Not, number one, because God brought him to me, but number two, because he told me, he said, BMM, I forgive you in advance. I didn't know it was possible to forgive somebody in advance. Me, I was holding on to things. And he would say to me, ultimately, he would say to me, you know what? I forgive you. In I, I forgive you even before you said I'm sorry. And I started to think about it, that this must what, be what Jesus did. Because on the cross, when everyone was still throwing things at him, he took a look at everybody. They were telling him, save yourself. They were saying all kinds of things to him. And he looked at them and he said, it is finished. That is even your sins in this day, finished. He turned to the thief on his side and he said to him, today 
You will be with me in paradise. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. It will cost you something. Whatever it costs you, be willing to pay the price. And sometimes, because it's a transactional kingdom, people would offend you. You would lose money in the process. But will you remember that there is something beyond this place when it comes to kingdom? Next week, we'll continue the tale of the kingdom. We'll look at an, another parable or two, and we'll see how the concept of kingdom will evolve. But before I go, what is the thing that I see? I see that the kingdom of God as it is here is not perfect, but it is better than the world. It is not perfect, but it is better than the world. And so, sometimes we just must wink at the things that we see. And set our faces. Say, I know why I'm here. I know where I'm headed. I will not allow anything to take me out. Because some of the things that would press you as you get in kingdom are things that don't matter. From 10,000 talents to 100 denarii. If you put them aside, they don't compare at all. But if you got forgiven for $1.5 billion, Will you honestly want to kill someone and commit murder for $2,000? Think about it. So as spiritual as kingdom is, there are things you must process with your intellect. Weigh them and see whether it is worth losing this kingdom for. The kingdom of God continues to evolve. But the greatest thing is that no matter what, I am going to go through the eye of the needle. Everything that men are screaming hallelujah over here, I'm going to let them down and I'm going to cross over. Because when I get over there, even if I didn't get anything back, just to be able to behold my Savior face to face, it will be worth everything else that I could ever do. To get into kingdom costs God the life of his son. He said, you did not take it from me, I laid it down. How can you discount or discountenance or disdain such great a sacrifice on your behalf simply because somebody didn't greet you when they came into church? If they are talkers, they will talk about you. That's why they're in church. If they're in church and they're still talking, imagine what they would do if they were outside. You ought to just say, forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. Now the reality I must confess is it is easier said than done, especially for Heidi's like me. But I do know that this is what is required. So whether I, I do it 100% is not the issue, it's that I'm working on it. The question is, will you work on it too? If you're on this broadcast and you've not given your life to Jesus, or you're in this room and you've not given your life to Jesus, as we round up, it's very simple. It's Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Because the staying power for kingdom, because if kingdom can be hard, it means that there is a staying power that is required. The staying power for kingdom can only come if you have given your life to Jesus. Remember the earnest deposit, the spirit of God on the inside of you. So if you would like to give your life to Jesus today, just say with me, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. If you're saying it out there, please type it. Someone will send us your names and we will pray along with you that the Lord will surround you with his hedge, that he will make sure that even when he takes you into this kingdom, that he will preserve you, that the things that will make you want to run out will not happen as fast as they are want to happen. That the Lord will hand you to someone who would not abuse you, but will keep you in that place and nurture you and treasure you and recognize that it is for you that Jesus died. So if you would like to give your life to Jesus, just say with me, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. And for the rest of us, please, please pray. Say, Lord, in your mercy, grant me the grace to forgive. Seventy times seven. That's the number that Jesus gave. But let me be one that can call forgive, regardless of how many times. And as you're praying that prayer, remember to tell the Lord, may it never be too costly for me to let anything go just so that I will gain heaven. Because what shall it promise, profit a man? If he gains the whole world and he loses his son. So, Almighty Father, thank you. Thank you for revealing more of kingdom to us. 
Lord, we ask, oh God, for the grace to live according to this kingdom. Father, Lord, the standards of the kingdom look really high. But we are sure that your grace that empowers, empowers us to do that which we cannot ordinarily do. We come upon us in this moment. In the name of Jesus, and we will live according to the template and the tenets of kingdom. Help us, oh God, because of ourselves we can do nothing. And let your name be glorified forever. Thank you, God of heaven. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Thank you so much. God bless you.